thing that would stop it from passing right now is if the president were not to sign it. We will not allow a situation where stealing of elections becomes the order of the day. Court now moves to court seeking to block the president's assent to the contentious election laws bill. You miss one single step, you mess up everything, mess up everyone. You cannot have the number of A's radically reducing from where they were in 2015 to a mere 141 in 2016. Plus rising pressure on the government to audit the KCSE results. Kamaduale atapeleko mahakamani wajue hapa kuna zerekali. And I asked them to produce the venue, the time, the video. Wiper leaders invoke the ICC in the offensive remarks attributed to Majority Leader Aden Duale. La muhimu ni kwamba hakuna siasa zozote karika maswada ya shuguli za utendaji. And the state's explanation raises more questions than answers to the withdrawal of Johor's and Kingi's security details. A very good evening to you. Thank you very much for joining us. Those are our top stories, but also in our discussion tonight, we will be focusing on this whole debate, manual versus electronic electoral systems. What are we missing in this conversation and what do we really need to be focusing on? My guest tonight, John Alan Namu, the CEO of Africa Uncensored. We have John Walubengo, who's an ICT expert and a lecturer at Multimedia University, as well as Ambassador Jack Tumwa. He's a former commissioner at the now defunct ECK to talk about how practical all of this will be. Of course, our usual segments, including my take, is back tonight. Welcome to the show. I'm Yvonne Okwara Matole, and our sign language interpreter is Meresha Owiti. But let's get to our top stories of the day first. Now, the High Court will tomorrow hear a case by Cord seeking to block President Uhuru Kenyatta from assenting to the controversial Electoral Laws Amendment Bill. Cord argues that the two special sittings leading to the amendments were irregular. But as our reporter Murimi Mwangi now tells us, debate is still ongoing regarding the National Assembly and Senate votes on the bill. With only 14 days for President Uhuru Kenyatta to assent to or reject the contentious election laws amendment bill. On page 17. The opposition coalition court will on Monday argue an application at the High Court seeking to block President Kenyatta from signing the bill into law. This as debate continued for the third day over the Thursday Senate vote that passed the bill without any amendments. This law has already passed. The only uh, thing that would stop it from passing right now is if the president were not to sign it. And it is the president's prerogative to decide what he wants to do. However, having said that, even after the law has been passed, if somebody were to feel that they still want to bring an amendment to the House, it is within the standing orders that such a thing can be done. At the High Court, called through CIA Senator Senior Counsel James Orengo argues that the special seatings at the National Assembly and the Senate that culminated in the Thursday vote were irregular and therefore want the High Court to nullify the verdicts of both houses. 
among those listed as respondents in the suit as speakers of the two houses and the attorney general court is set to meet all its elected and aspiring leaders on wednesday with fresh threats to resume street demonstrations the last time we went the, the court went to the streets we lost lives have those lives been brought back now that there are some sanity no have those properties lost been brought back no. To believe when a panga kuiba kura, nazis do nakutana, siku ya jumatan, watu elfu kumi na saiti, ambao wote wanasimama viti, kuamua Kenya itaenda na mnagani. The laws that we are talking about are not for Jubilee, they are not for God, they are for, the nation, for every Kenyan. You cannot build a 24-25 floor house and you install a lift and you fail to have staircases. The most divisive clause of the bill relates to the provision for the country's electoral agency, IEBC, to revert to a manual backup system in the event that technology fails, a loophole which court argues could be manipulated to tamper with the election results. I will therefore deal with this matter decisively. We will not allow a situation where stealing of elections becomes the order of the day. It is not possible to resolve every difference in the house in the streets. Because what would have been the purpose of electing a parliament if then the decisions are not made in parliament, they are made in the streets. With a contentious bill now in the hands of President Uhuru Kenyatta, the courts could be the opposition coalition's last line of defense as debate on the Thursday Senate vote continues. Muremi Mwangi Kichie News in Nairobi. It is important to mention that um, all of these wrangles are happening today, the 8th of January 2017. We're exactly seven months to the election. This time, seven months from now, hopefully votes will be counted and there'll be telling process and we'll be hoping to get some provisional results at least. But then it's also important to note that seven months to the election, there are still a number of issues that remain pending with respect to procurement of strategic election materials. So let's take a look at that now. If you um, see the timelines here. Now, um, those are some of the timelines. If you can go back a little bit uh, to that first timeline that is there, which is about procuring strategic election materials. Now this, according to the IBC timeline that was given last year, was to happen all through from December the 26th, 2016, all through to just about two days to the election. Now it's everything to do with ballot papers, the electoral system, even up till transport that will be used by the very various election officials. Now, of course, they were supposed to authorize uh, the ballot printing by the 3rd of July and the delivery of those ballot papers was supposed to start around the end of June. That's around the 28th to July the 19th. Now, then we know what happened last year. Court went to the streets, the protests, the Joint Parliamentary Select Committee came up and came together with the amendments in which, this is what they said, uh, that we wanted an integrated electronic electoral system that harmonizes biometric voter registration kits, electronic voter identification kits, and the result transmission system, and that this was to be delivered eight months to the election. We are now seven months to, and we don't have this in place yet. Now, these systems were supposed to be tested in June this year to just make sure they're okay, they're working. Remember uh, some of the instances we had in 2017? But let's talk about some of the challenges to these timelines that we have laid down for you that remain pending today, seven months to the election. Well, if you recall, during uh, the JPSC uh, hearings, IEBC actually claimed that those amendments were not in sync with the existing laws on procurement in the country. They, in fact, asked the commission for some leeway to negotiate with suppliers to fast track that because, of course, they mentioned uh, the fact that there was uh, the Procurements uh, Act that might not be in tandem with this, that they did not have enough time to procure this between October the 4th and December the 8th, which is when we should have procured that tech. And they said that time was not enough and they sought some middle ground. And I think they were given some sort of leeway by the uh, JLAC uh, committee in parliament. Now, of course, here's another challenge to that timeline. The debate in Parliament that we have seen and now court saying they're going to court tomorrow to see if they can stop the president from assenting those amendments into law. 
Let me also remind you that the ballot paper printing tender has been suspended at this time. Code sued the IEBC and the review board saying that 2.5 billion shillings contract by a Dubai based company was unlawfully awarded um, and that it did not, uh, it was contrary to the election laws in the country and the Public Procurement and Assets Disposal Act. The next hearing for that is January the 19th. Let me also remind you that that tender for the electronic system was supposed to be open tomorrow. That is the 9th. That may not happen. So this is where we are with respect to procurement for election materials, those strategic ones. Seven months to, we don't seem to see any hope for that. What will happen? This will form part of our discussion a little later on. Where are we when it comes to that? Do you believe we are ready to have a credible, free, fair and peaceful election seven months from today? That is a question we're running on social media. Please do get your thoughts in. The hashtag to use is Checkpoint. Let's take a look at some other stories making headlines today. Trade Unions Congress of Kenya has joined the Kenya Union of Teachers and Code Principal Raila Odinga in demanding for an audit into the 2016 KCSE exam results, terming them as unrealistic. The Union Secretary General Wilson Socion, together with top union officials, now want the government to move in with speed and conduct that audit. <laughs> Education Cabinet Secretary Dr. Fred Matiangi has come under fire over the marking of the 2016 KCSE exams, which were released a month after completion. It is a true and credible reflection of who our children are and how they scored. Without leakage, without any help, without manipulation and massaging of the figures. Trade Unions Congress of Kenya is supporting NAT in criticizing the manner in which the exams were marked and transmitted. The union officials said it is alarming that there were mass failures in the 2016 results and a comprehensive scrutiny should be launched. We feel that the fact that there were the kind of mass failures in that examination, something was not right. That's why we are actually calling on the government not to cancel the exam results, but to institute an in-depth audit. The figures for 2015 were declared to us at Caledonia, subject by subject. This one at Shimolatewa, even the chief executive neck did not speak. A deep CEO does not speak. Then it means those results are spurious and unauthentic. The union now joins code leader Raila Odinga in ordering for an audit into the exams. Raila termed the examination marking process a fraud and called for a commission of inquiry to audit the results. The Kenya National Union of Teachers has written to the clerk of the National Assembly seeking Parliament's intervention in having the exams cancelled. In fact, these exams is one of the biggest genocide of children. It's a genocide. The ministry is quiet for two days or three days. That means they are guilty. The trade union adds that there was a clear lack of equal grading and moderation. Kenyans have also added their voice with a majority saying there was clear credibility. Auditing or not auditing is not the issue. I think the issue is in, in integrity. How credible was the exam before? Unaona <laughs> A significant number of candidates who sat the 2016 KCSE examinations scored grades of D minus and below, falling below the threshold of university placement, which requires a minimum grade of C plus. Dr. Matiangi has been praised for delivering a credible examination that had previously been marred by widespread cheating, but now has to answer into what many call an irregular distribution curve in the results. Caroline B, KT News. Wiper leaders led by Kalonzo Musioka are now threatening to invoke the International Criminal Court into the case of the audio recording allegedly attributed to Parliament Majority Leader Adan Duale. The leaders want the ICC to investigate the source and motive of the offensive audio clip. <laughs> 
An audio recording linked to Majority Leader Aden Duale continues to arouse condemnation Wiper Leader Kalonzo Musioka, whose party also happens to be the target of the recorded sentiments leading the onslaught. We are putting Jubilee on notice. Kama Duale ata peleko mahakamani. Wajue hapa kuna serikali. Izo matusi, lakini upumbavu ambao nasema ya kwamba watu wawezi kuishi. Garisi. Watu machako zawezi kuishi. Garisi. Na ye naishi Nairobi. Na na Nairobi ni inchi ya wa Masai. On Friday, leaders from Aden Duales Garissa backyard showed up at the CID headquarters in connection to utterances in the audio clip that called for blocking of the Akamba people and Waipa supporters from taking part in elections in the area. Information we have right now is that two people have been attacked. Two Kenyans from the Kamba tribe have been attacked in Garissa now, so far. And, and the likelihood of this thing spiraling out of control are very rife. And today, Kalonzo has threatened to summon the attention of the International Criminal Court at The Hague to zero in on Aden Duale and Garissa County. Yale Duale mezungumza Garissa. Tayari sisi tutaandika kama wanakor. Tupeane notice kwa prosecutor wa ICC. Mambo ya kitokea Garissa. Mweshmua Duale mjumbe wa Dujis. Atakuwa me commit a crime under international law. But Duale insists he has nothing to do with the audio clip, claiming it is a concussion of falsehoods by his political competitors. And I asked them to produce the venue, the time, the video, the gadget, the person who recorded that purported fake clip. Meanwhile, Makweni Senator Mutula Kilonzo Jr. has written to the Directorate of Criminal Investigation calling for action. The letter also copied to NCIC Chair Francis Caparo reads in part, Concerned citizens have sent me a voice clip which quotes the leader of majority in the National Assembly, Aden Duale, making disparaging remarks and utterances that may be interpreted or construed to mean that the Akamba people in Garissa should be ostracized. The alleged remarks in their ordinary meaning are in violation of the National Integration Act and amount to hate speech under the law. Kindly cause the above clip to be investigated and action be taken on the same. Even as he distances himself from the latest line of fire, Duale has in the recent past been caught on camera threatening Justice George Odunga, many quarters terming his utterances unfortunate as the country heads to the general elections. Mark Namaswa, KTN News. State House has today responded to the withdrawal of security men seconded to Mombasa Governor Hassan Ali Joho and his Kilifi counterpart, Amazon Jeffa Kingi. Government spokesman, or rather State House spokesman, Manoa Sipisu says the withdrawal was purely based on a restructuring program of regional command structures in the two counties. What State House, however, failed to explain was why this was happening just in the two counties, and in fact, for the second time. KTN's Coast Regional reporter, Francis Ontomwa, has more. For the first time, the dramatic withdrawal of security detail attached to the two governors, State House was speaking. What Joho and Kingi's camp call political malice, State House spokesman Manoa Isipisu calls police command restructuring, explanations that further deepen the puzzle. The important thing is that there is no political motive in operational matters within the police force. It's up to the various commands to make decisions as they deem fit in, uh, in, in response to uh, emerging security issues within their jurisdictions. Being the second time the act falls on Joho and Kingi, some find the spokesman's assertions unconvincing. But for further explanation, ACP so refers the matter to security organs. Uh, reorganizations happen all the time, all around the country. Uh, this is no exception. Local commands make local decisions. We must not uh, always jump to the fact that this or that must have happened to make it happen. And as State House was giving its side of the story, Jubilee leaders in Mombasa were working on their statement, 
They feel the experience should teach a few lessons to Joho to perhaps give more regard to the presidency. Since he keeps talking of having a big envelope, go and employ your people. Why should we as taxpayers pay for you? What are you afraid of? Why do you need 15 bodyguards? Are you a head of state or what? Wewe binadamu moja uchukua polisi kumna tano wafungie nyumbani kwako. Ukitoka watoka na tisa, wengine wameba kinyumbani. And at the expense, yet to see sister taxpayers. Joho's camp has not been left behind, saying they will steadfastly remain on course until Joho finds his footing. The governor is still yet to touch down in Mombasa from Ghana. Kenya inongozo na katiba na kila moja na haki ya kulindwa. Na tutataka tuseme kuwa sikuwa gavana peki yake. Ulinzi ndani ya Mombasa na Kenya mzima tutataka udumishwe. Atutataka ukoloni mamboleo bada uwe uko tu na ukiritimba. We are tired as Mombasa residents. We are tired. Please give us peace in this county. Frosty relations between the president and Joho can be traced back to December 2015 when the governor claimed the president was sidelining him during his coastal tours. Even as Joho and Kingi claim their lives are in danger, State House has ruled out malice, saying the whole plot was based on a scheme to reorganize the police structure down here in the coast, what then now throws in speculations into the whole matter. Francis Otomoa, KTN News, State House, Mombasa. With the only hours to the scheduled burial of the late Mark To, controversy continues to shroud the veteran politician's death. His lawyer, Samson Simon Lilan, maintains Mark To's death was a homicide. His family, however, has announced that they will disregard a court order to suspend his burial scheduled for tomorrow. Two days after an Eldoret court issued an injunction to stop the burial of former nominated MP Mark Kiptar Beito, following a case filed by the Eldoret best lawyer Simon Lilan, the family is defying the orders and flew the body of the veteran politician ahead of tomorrow's burial at his capsulate home in Wasingishu County. Lilan has now threatened to seek fresh court orders to exhume the body of the ex-MP if the family disregards the court order. To bury Makto without the fulfillment of those conditions, I will change my prayers from seeking samples and from seeking burial at Mary's place to exhumation of the body. If they bury Makto, I will exhume the body until I get the samples. He says the family is prohibited by law to disregard court orders and will not allow the burial to proceed without an independent autopsy conducted on Toh's body. I am told the committee has been disbanded. The committee which was planning the, the funeral, you know those defendants I have taken to court. The reason is so that they can say that they, did not, they were not involved in the burial. They want to, they want to, to bury Mokto through, through the back door by avoiding court orders. Sisi tutagadana na mashishi ya Mokto, hiyo court order tujebata, atujesafiwa, na hata kama kuna court order, tutadila ya badai. This comes as the report of Chief Government Pathologist Dr. Johansen Oduor indicates the former assistant minister died of a heart attack. Several people called my lawyer with veiled threats. But my lawyer told them that he is not the type to be threatened. They also called the magistrate who issued the orders and, and threatened him. Even as the side shows continue, hundreds of Wasingishu County residents flock the diseased home at Maziwa Farm for the interdenominational funeral service. Leaders heaped praise on the diseased. Bwana Makto kila mara nikiwa hata kwa katika serikali alikuwa anaongea na mimi ananiambia kaa hivi Gladys. Saa zingine siku ile nilikuwa natoka napigwa kule katika judiciary akakuja mpaka kwangu akaniambia bunieleze hii ni shida gani nasikia hapa. Na akakuja kwangu akaketi na mimi na akasikiza vizuri. Na juzi vile alisikia nataka kuwania kiti ya wasingishu women rep wasingishu county hata yeye ndiye aliniambia kiti na kutosha nile ya women rep wasingishu county akaniambia watu kama wewe tunataka katika bunge. Ninjiwote kwa area hii, 
he was a peace leader wakati kulikuwa na any conflict makto stood by us and is one guy one person ambaye Kenya namtambua ulimwengu anamtambua makto ni mtu alikuwa mtu ajabu ama alikuwa kiongozi alikuwa mzazi alikuwa mzee mimi mwenyewe nikisimama hapa nimepoteza rafiki nimepoteza baba nimepoteza mwenye huwa alikuwa ananiongoza kwa siasa zangu Elvis Kosgei KT News Maziwa Farm Nwasingishu County All right, welcome back. Thank you so much for staying with us on Checkpoint. Our discussion now on all of the, the debates that have been taking place at the National Assembly, at the Senate, we've heard quite a bit. Now, before I reintroduce you to my guests tonight, I want us to listen into what the Attorney General had to say when he went before the Senate early last week on this issue of the amendments to the electoral law, but specifically on whether we have a manual versus electronic electoral system. This is what he had to say. How do we count the vote? We have no machine for counting the vote. It's a manual process. We empty the debe and we count. If we emphasize the electronic, we will be ignoring the reality of what happens on the day we vote. We have no legal problem. What we have is we have a low threshold of trust. In the nature of systems, it may be the machine that is wrong, not the individual. Imagine what that means if the machine is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is in Thika town, or is in Kisumu town, or is in Kakamega town. The first conclusion that the commentators say is that there has been a deliberate effort to cut out the people of Machakos, the people of Thika, and so on. And so on. The, the peasant farmer from Moranga, who woke up very early to milk his cows and carry his materials and feed the cows and so on, his fingers are not without uh, contact with the material he was using. The failure of the machine to recognize him cannot be cured by backup. Okay, now he's not the only one who's spoken that. A number of people did. Uh, and sometimes you're just left with your head reeling. So let's try and uh, make that as simple as we can on the show tonight. With me uh, to discuss this issue, John Alanamu, who's the CEO of Africa Uncensored. And also, you'll remember, for that documentary, 50 Plus One, which took a serious audit of the last general election in 2013. Thank you, John. Um, it's good to have you back, as always. Uh, also, John Malubengo is an ICT expert and a lecturer at Multimedia University. University, as well as from Kakamega, we'll be speaking to Ambassador Jack Tumwa. Um, he knows all too well the process of managing an election. He did that uh, under the now defunct Electoral Commission of Kenya. Um, before we get into, uh, into defining what an electronic electoral system is, and we'll come to you, John. Uh, you're both Johns, yes. just occurred to me. Which one? Olive Bengo, all right. Yeah. Let's start with you, John <laughs> Allen. Um, yeah. There's been so much that's been said. Can you sort of crystallize all of these things that we've had? What are your thoughts on everything we've had regarding this debate? Well, my, my thought is very clear. Uh, Cord and Jubilee are reading from two pages of the same history book, but not reading them together. Cord, I think, is traumatized from 2007 in what happened in that election, which fell, and rightly so. I mean, it was traumatic. Jubilee is very conveniently using the failures of 2013 to justify what this manual system is. None of these people are reading our history together to show that indeed, in fact, what we need is a system that is both electronic and manual in some parts and in some ways. And that the failures of 2007 and the failures of 2013 are not being rightly audited for what, what they really were. For instance, with 2013, you just heard um, uh, the Attorney General talking about people having dirty fingerprints mm -hmm. and not being able to be identified, when in fact a large number of the electronic voter identification devices in 2013 didn't work because they were not charged properly. So the failure actually was not of the technology, it was of people plugging in those things and not charging them properly. Of course, um, also the fact that 
many of them arrived four days to the election. So conflating different facts and just trying to make some sort of cauldron to suit your argument is exactly what is happening here. And nobody is really taking cognizance of what really is the problem and the crisis that we're hurtling towards. Okay, and we'll talk about what really is the problem. But, you know, we've had so many conversations about what an electronic system is not, what it is, and we're hearing this from politicians. Uh, to be fair, a lot of Kenyans are confused. Uh, so, Walubengo, if you can, just very briefly, and we'll have some graphics on screen to just, you know, mm. explain this. Explain to us Kenya's electronic electoral system. What is it? Do we vote electronically? Lots of people saying, yeah, when we go, we will vote electronically. Um, so just break that down very quickly for us, if you can. Okay, yeah. Basically, what uh, the Attorney General was saying is right, that we are going to vote manually. Uh, but he's wrong in that that is not the bone of contention. The bone of contention lies elsewhere, mm -hmm. rather than whether we'll vote manually or not. And the bone of contention lies in the three uh, electronic components uh, that the Kriegler report and indeed the IEBC audit of post-election 2013 recommends that we should use electronic systems to, to build confidence in, in, the, in, the, in the integrity of the election outcomes. And those three uh, components or equipments, if we may call them, mm -hmm. are basically number one, BVR, mm -hmm. EVID, mm -hmm. and RTS, the Results Transmission System. If you allow me, I'll just tell uh, the viewers what those three things do. Mm -hmm. uh, the BVR allows you to, to capture the, the voters' biometrics. This could be the fingerprint, it could be the palm print, mm -hmm. it could be the earlobe. Mm -hmm. It could even be the voice. So during registration, IBS will capture those biological attributes of a voter. Ask yourself, why will they go to that extent? Why, why do they want to mm. capture that? Mm -hmm. In order to use the same to verify that you are indeed the one who was supposed to vote. Right. And that brings in the second equipment, mm -hmm. the EVID, which really is the bone of contention. Mm -hmm. The EVID will then, uh, as you queue to vote, you first have to be verified through your biological attributes. Many a times it's the fingerprint. So the fingerprint confirms that you are indeed the same fella who registered, registered. a while back uh -huh. and therefore you are cleared to vote. Okay. And uh, within that system, the EVID also records the number of people who have voted, uh -huh. so that at the end of the polling period, that number can be compared to the ballots that have been casted. Mm -hmm. If there's a discrepancy, then usually that is a reflection of either ghost workers mm -hmm. or duplicate voting. Okay. And finally, Yvonne, mm -hmm. the results transmission. And I think Kenyans are more familiar with that mm -hmm, one because mm -hmm. you're watching TV and you're seeing the results right. trickling in and yeah. the graphics. Right. That completes the third component. Okay. And they're, they're all important. All right. But to be fair, even after you get um, uh, identified electronically, you vote manually. Manually, precisely. And the counting of the votes is, is done manual. manually. So exactly. it's, yeah. as we know it, one vote for exactly. Walubengo, one for Namu, and exactly. you know, one for... Okay, so now that we understand that, um, so why, where does the argument then come in? If you talk about the electronic voter identification <coughs> device, does it need an internet connection? Absolutely not. Because that is what we're saying, that in certain areas where, mm. you know, the internet connection isn't mm. as strong, does okay. it? The argument of the internet uh, applies to the results transmission. Yeah. Um, because for you to transmit results, uh, you need the, either the mobile network mm -hmm. or if the mobile network is down, you can do it through the satellite technology. But in as far as um, uh, electronic voter identification is concerned, you don't need the internet. Um, you just need your fingerprint. So all the data of all the registered voters in that polling station is already we'll saved on, on this device. Exactly. Okay. All right. So we have an understanding of this, and I'd, I'd, we'll go to Ambassador Tuma in just a moment. So then, so what are we arguing about, John? Honestly, it's it's really just 
if you if you really boil it down to mm -hmm. it, it, it the, the true argument here is a lack of trust it's a lack of trust between cord and jubilee mm -hmm. between the parties that are going to be contesting this election it, there's a lack of trust in the uh, iebc itself and because nobody trusts the other party then everybody is trying as far as possible to dig in and ensure that their argument right. is preserved but as there's also the element of history 2013 mm -hmm. uh what happened there you did an extensive investigative piece on this yeah. what happened with the results transmission in 2013 for many that may not remember uh what took place then well essentially it collapsed because of some of the reasons that we're talking about mm -hmm. now there were no in there was no internet connection the, the rts's themselves weren't fully charged the people who are handling uh, those th that equipment didn't know how to handle them because they had arrived so briefly before mm -hmm. the election and therefore we had basically an, a, 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 an election that depended on technology where people who are managing those systems had absolutely or, or very little clue about how to manage them so the failures really were not to do with the technology itself it was to do with the fact that IBC um, had procured these things very late. Uh -huh. The people who were on the ground didn't have the time to use them properly. And it, it, where they did, there were some failures. But where it worked, it worked well. And the key to understanding the fact that it wasn't a, an, an issue of technology, look at the by-elections after that mm -hmm. and how it worked and how results transmission worked then. Right. And then you can see that there's a flawed argument in what, what's being talked about. Now. Okay, and we'll come back and speak about those uh, twin by-elections, by the way, which used uh, that system um, in just a minute. And also, whether it seems like history is repeating itself all over again uh, with some of the challenges you've just mentioned. Uh, but Ambassador Tuma, let's bring you into this conversation now. Uh, it seems like on both sides of the political divide and even amongst ordinary Kenyans, there is no doubt that a backup system is required. What are your thoughts about this argument? Um, having before yourself managed an election, what do you think about these arguments back and forth just seven months to uh, an election this year? It's bad argument. <clears throat> you want to let me say Happy New Year. Happy New Year. For the time being. <laughs> it is a bad argument because, like someone has already said, what is the argument all about? The electronic voting system is a new technology. As it's an evolving technology. And not many countries, quite a number of countries have been using this system, some successfully, some with the, with the mistakes. We actually talked about the electronic voting system way back in 1905. We wanted to introduce it when we were at UCK but we didn't have the resources, but we planned for it, and we are the people who gave curricula the idea that we have to start thinking about evolve, starting this system come past 207. Now, there's an argument that the technology can fail. That is correct. It's true, the technology can fail. Technology can be manipulated. We all agree that technology can be manipulated. When you look at the manual, we have got experience from the past that manual has been manipulated in many times. When we did a post-election audit in following the 1997 elections, we found that some stations in Nyanza, some stations in Central and in Rift Valley had in excess of 98% water turnout. To me, that didn't sound right. In fact, some stations had over and above 101% water turnout. So I think the problem here is trust. The problem is, if we were to go back to manual, do we trust that the returning officer, the presiding officer, the clerk, will all work in trust so that they give the people of Kenya an election that they deserve? So both systems have got weaknesses. I was reading today an article by a member of the IEBC. They were stating that it is not from electronic to manual. The system that they are going to use is biometric. That is at the registration stage. If it is true that they are, moving, they are not going to manual, 
And I believe having listened to the debate in Parliament, both sides seem to say yes. Let us go uh, use the integrated voting system, but in the course of failure, let's have another biometric at the registration level being used as an alternative. The problem and the issue that was raised during the debate, if you recall, was to complementary. And the definition of complementary therefore has to, was, didn't come out very clearly and it looked like some parties wanted to leave it loose and I think that is what brought us to where we are. But if we say at the registration level, if we are going to have a biometric system to complement the integrated, then actually I see no problem. Again, huh? why have we come to this level? What? Why have we come to this stage? It is a question of trust. Someone has just mentioned trust. There is very little trust between our political parties. There's so much thumb, uh, there is so much talking, there's so much abuse. There's that lack of trust is a repeat of what we witnessed when we were coming to the 207 elections. Nobody wanted to listen to the other. And that brought us the problems there where we are. So I think the starting point is we have to find ways and means of build, building trust. Our members of parliament have to find a way of talking. This thing, this uh, act has been passed by the National Assembly. It has been passed by the Senate and it is waiting to go to, for the assent by the president. Okay, all right. Um, it's a very difficult time. Yes, uh, Ambassador, just hold that thought because you keep talking about trust and everyone is talking about that. Um, before we come to how you legislate trust, because clearly, I mean, you know, what, how do we instill trust in everybody? I just want to talk about a backup. What would that yeah. look like? Because then there's the argument about yeah. a manual backup system versus, versus an electronic digital. backup system or a digital one. Mm -hmm. What options do we have? Okay. Um, First, to decide whether to go manual backup or digital mm -hmm. backup, we need to understand uh, what disease the digital system was trying to cure. Okay. And that disease is basically about ghost voters. You know, the manual system was a printout, mm -hmm. list of names, maybe you are 10,000 people in that mm -hmm. polling yeah. station. Yeah, and for this instance, it'll be 500 per polling station. Yeah, yes? for this okay. time there'll be 500. Yeah. Uh -huh. So at five o'clock, maybe only 400 showed up. Mm -hmm. So you have a balance of 100 that did not show up. So if you have a manual printout, nothing stops you from crossing out mm -hmm. those 100, picking a ballot and voting on their behalf. The electronic system came to cure that. How does it do that? Without a fingerprint, you can't vote. Or if you don't have a fingerprint, you can get a facial recognition or an earlobe recognition and you vote. But the key thing with that electronic system is that it <coughs> keeps a tally of who actually came mm -hmm. physically. physically. Okay. And once political parties know that there's a tally, they're not going to have the flexibility to vote on behalf of the absentees. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's what the electronic system is curing. Now, it is true that the electronic system may collapse. Mm -hmm. And so the question becomes, if it has collapsed, what do we do? And one side of the political di di divide was saying, um, we cannot send away the voter because yeah. they have a constitutional right. And, and that is true. Yeah. Uh, but there's the other argument that if uh, one EVID has failed for various reasons, maybe the power is down, mm -hmm. why didn't you have duplicate power? Mm -hmm. Or maybe uh, the software got corrupted, right. why didn't you think of that in advance and then have people to make sure that it works? Okay. So do we go manual backups or do we go digital backups? I would rather we go digital because the manual backup brings us back to the original problem. Okay. So Not unless somebody has a manual backup 
that can eliminate uh, ghost voters. Uh -huh. yeah. So what you're saying is, even within the digital realm, there is there are options, digital for, options yeah. uh, for a backup. Yeah. Um, John, let's yeah. talk about 2013, 2007, and you were talking about some of the similarities you're seeing mm. um, between those elections and now. Again, the 2000, uh, you know, the EVIDs then, or the results transmission system yeah. collapsing. Are we going down the same road? What are some of the similarities you see? I think the one thing that we should look at, and you pointed it out at the beginning of the program, is the timelines that mm -hmm. we seem to be missing. All of our, our dates are, are being missed and being missed by, by, a, 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 large, by a very wide market. Right. For instance, um, yesterday in the papers, there was an advertisement um, put out there by IABC talking about the cancellation of the opening of tenders mm -hmm. for the Kenya Integrated Electoral Management System. If you look back to 2012 and what happened with the procurement of uh, the biometric voter registration kits, the electronic voter identification kits, that is, well, the circumstances were different, but the delay was the same, right? <clears throat> Meaning that if we continue to have these delays, we're going to be in a situation where we have uh, people handling the equipment that are not trained to handle the equipment and mm. then you're going to have the kind failures. of failures that you're talking about so in that way that th there's definitely a problem a, a second a second issue is a lack of bipartisanship look to 2007 and the ippg deal mm -hmm. that was rubbished by one part one side of uh, of, uh, of of the political divide look at what's happening now with the electoral laws that's definitely a very clear pattern as to what's going on look at the rhetoric that's that's ramping up in, in uh, funerals and wherever, whichever venues they're, they're choosing to pick. Mm -hmm. That is another signal that we're heading down a very <coughs> similar path. I'm not going to say dangerous as yet, mm -hmm. but it is certainly ominous. And finally, in the five years that we have been talking about, um, uh, we have been not discussing the election. That is very similar to what happened prior to the, 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 the previous elections. Why don't we have an audit that is out there that is independent of what happened, what really happened in the 2013 election. Why is it that to date there are Form 34s that are missing from different parts of the country so we cannot have a full audit of the last election and therefore a full understanding of what we need to fix? These are the, th these are the similarities that I see and unfortunately they are not giving us very good signs of what's going to happen down the road. All right, Ambassador Tumwa, you talked a lot about trust. So how do we build trust? How do we get trust? I mean, in this country, we love to either legislate or go to court uh, to sort out a number of these issues. Now, some of these options don't exactly help us in terms of building trust. How do we do that? I want to repeat, with that position of oh, having the, either the electronic or the manual not giving us satisfactory answers, I talk, go back to trust. And I'm saying this. We need to identify credible and competent people to man the electoral process. It is important that it does, even if we had the proper electronic systems and we didn't have people we trust, they cannot deliver. Let us compel it because we know we have become very manipulative as a nation. My request to, the, to our members of parliament is let make the electoral offenses punishable even by prison so that if you take up the appointment to be a returning officer a presiding officer a clerk you know that you are taking a very risky business if you mess it up you you may cause death to many people so let us legislate and make elect, electoral man, management of elections a very very sensitive matter so that those who take it take it knowing that they risk going to prison if they make any mistakes. Competence, someone has just talked about competence. It is a pity that we are running late, very late actually as far as the competence is concerned. Even if we were to get these systems now, do we have sufficient time to equip these people with sufficient training so that when they go to various polling stations, they know what is expected? So. It is a pity that there are a lot of environmental factors being pushed, especially by our political class, to the, to the IBC and making it very difficult to operate. We are grading ourselves for a failure. 
And the earlier we recognize this, the better it is going to be for this country. Otherwise, we are pre preparing. And of course, it will be very easy for us to turn around and say it is IBS which has made mistakes when the environmental factors like legislations coming in late, procurement coming in late, training of the recruitment and training of personnel coming in late, it makes it very, very difficult to operate. So let us go into uh, overdrive. All of us, the political parties, the executive, and uh, all those who are concerned with the election, let's go into an overdrive knowing <coughs> we don't have the luxury of time to enable us to have some form of acceptable elections. All right. Okay. Thank you. Ambassador uh, uh, Tuma joining us there from Kakamega and he's talking about maybe some measures, you know, uh, making this punishable, uh, you know, by prison term. Um, maybe some of these things, you know, impunity, which seems to be sort of the reigning uh, atmosphere in the country. Uh, I want us to close. Well, Ubengo, I'll start with you. We have had, you know, some success with results transmission. Yeah. Uh, for Kenyans who may not remember, the twin by elections in Kalokol Ward in Turkana and Mosiro in Kajiado, that happened last October. Even the, the IBC, even the referendum, <laughs> but the IBC re relied on satellite, especially in, in places, places where GSM yeah. network uh, failed, and obviously yeah. Turkana, uh, you know, a far flung area. Yeah. So, what are your closing comments? You know, it's possible, but. Where should we be focusing, uh, uh, you know, our attention on now? Okay. For me, um, I would say that, you know, what value as Kenyans do we put in these elections? Uh, because, like, when we teach uh, business continuity planning, you, you weigh the options. You sit down and calculate, do I really treasure my enterprise? And the level at which you treasure your enterprise dictates the level of investments that you want to invest in the backup of the same. So if we treasure elections, I believe that we should sit down and be able to invest in the necessary backups mm -hmm. that should be able to make the election successful. At the moment, I don't see politicians um, demonstrating that level of uh, preciousness to these elections. If you're telling us that um, we're going to go back to 2007 type of environment, it, it doesn't reflect so well. And as I close, I want to just tell Kenyans the third component of results transmission. Why is it important? It is important because uh, the random nature at which the results are flocking in uh, denies um, any interested party that wants to manipulate the outcome, it denies them the stability needed in order to calculate how many votes they need to mm -hmm. cross the, the magic 50% plus one. Mm -hmm. So that randomness just eliminates that type of mischief. Uh, but if the results transmission is not working, what you have actually done is empowered those people who want to manipulate the system to do what they have to do. And RTS is so simple, I don't think we should be arguing about it, particularly because there's satellite communication. So in closing, I just want to ask the politicians to really sit down and decide, do we really treasure uh, the integrity of elections or not? And if we do, then I think we should invest accordingly. All right. Thank you. Namo, your final words? I think uh, decisions need to be made by three quarters, by politicians, by the IBC, and of course by the public. One of the, the less talked about parts of the Kriegler report was one of the, one of the issues that he had spoken about, which is, which is the overarching theme here. You cannot run an honest election in a dishonest environment, right? You cannot possibly use technology to cure dishonesty. Mm -hmm. And we have... We've seen that with IFMIS. Well, exactly. <laughs> You know, exactly. Supposed to be I mean, you can throw and, all yeah, sorts of technology right. at everything, but as long as the environment remains dishonest, then we are, we are not going to have an honest election. But we have two opportunities to cure this. If, if it does not come through the resolving of an impasse here, then it will come through the IEBC's own vetting of the candidates that run during the election. The IEBC needs to show some teeth there and actually show Kenyans that they can trust them to give them 
if not a perfect list, but a credible list of people who are going to be running for elective positions. And secondly, it comes down to Kenyans themselves. I mean, th there's a lot to be said about the environment that we live in right now and the, the kind of impact that political talk is having on us. We must transcend this. I don't know how it's going to be done. Because the voter education is about to begin. It, exactly. Yet everybody is already listening to exactly. their favorite politicians. And I think finally for the politicians themselves is to prepare themselves ahead of time, especially those who are going to be running, to lay out an infrastructure that they can rely on with credible facts and, and data should they not trust this election, whether it's Cord or Jubilee have the party agents that you need to be able to oversee those polling stations where you need them to be. That was sorely missing on one party's part in the last election. And that is the kind of infrastructure that you're going to be need, needing to uh, go forward. But finally, I mean, it's just to echo Kriegler's words, you can't run an honest election in a dishonest environment. All right, that's a good place to close our conversation. John Alanamu, John Walubengo, as well as Ambassador Jack Tumwa, I thank you all, gentlemen, for coming. See, that was possible to discuss manual versus electoral in a sane, sober environment, uh, you know, without throwing words at each other. And, uh, I mean, you know, what we have been subjected to, I think, over the last month or so has been, uh, you know, rather disappointing. And, and hopefully we can start to see this better. But, you know, like my guests today have said, it's about trust, it's about an honest environment, it's about what everybody is prepared to do, including you, the voter. So even as that voter education period begins, uh, think about that and perhaps uh, not necessarily listen to your favorite politicians, but listen to your conscience on what it says on this issue. Our question continues on social media. Do you think we have enough time to have a credible, free, fair and peaceful election? Uh, in seven months time keep them coming as well as your comments on our discussion tonight the hashtag is checkpoint i thank my guests once again for making the time to be with us you're watching checkpoint we'll be right back so now the number tonight is one you need to pay attention to if you have a child that is reporting to secondary school tomorrow remember it's the 9th of january that all of those uh secondary school students are reporting now the reason we focused on this number tonight is because we've heard allegations of parents saying that being charged exorbitant fees to go back to school so we saw it fit to remind you of this very important number that you need to bear in mind even as you start to pay your fees as you take your children to school tomorrow these are the guidelines that have been put in place and have actually been gazetted by law any other figure that you are given if it's not this figure then you need to report this so let me tell you about this matiangi fees guidelines that for day secondary school students, you will pay 9,374. For boarding school, you will pay 53,553. Now, this is what you pay the school levies as a parent, but the government also, remember, has its contribution to every student. So this is the per capita figure of 12,860 given by the government per student in every secondary school in the country. If you add this to the other numbers, it means the total school fees is for day school, 22,244. For um, uh, boarding schools, if you add this figure to the 53,000 we had before, it's a little over 66,000 shillings. Now, if this is according to the cabinet secretary, any school charges extra, then they should be able to give you the parent proof of authorization by the cabinet secretary. And he says it should be uh, prominently displayed on the notice board of the school. As a parent, you're supposed to insist on two receipts, one for this per capita payment by the government and the other for the school levies you are paying directly. Remember, if you're in a day school, 9,374. If you're in boarding school, 53,553. That's not all. The cabinet secretary has promised that he will visit selected schools to make sure that this adherence is strictly followed. Now, he also said that the school fees that you're seeing on your screens should be appropriately spread throughout the year. That's 50, 30, 20. That's in the first, second, and third term. Now, where do you go to if you don't see a figure like this in any secondary school that you are taking your child to tomorrow? You can report this to the regional educational coordinator and the country directors of education. They are responsible for ensuring that this is adhered to. If not, this is what the cabinet secretary is promising. And from what we've seen, we know him to be a man of his word. They will bar any defaulting principal from being a signatory to the accounts. 
So anything else that you see apart from this, and by the way, please disregard those messages uh, that are going around on social media about a certain number to call. Um, I spoke to officials of the Ministry of Education just this evening. They say those are hoaxes, but please do look for your regional education coordinator and the county directors of education. This is your number for the week. Okay, like we've been telling you, this is apparently a very significant date. It's the 8th of January 2017, exactly seven months to the election. How many days is that? Let's remind you about something we've been doing. It's exactly 211 days to the 2017 elections. If you do the math, it's 7.0333 months to the election. Lest we forget. You remember we did this uh, for the better part of 2016. We were reminding you of your constitutional right to vote. Now, this is important to let you know today that the voter registration process is continuous, but there is a second mass voter registration that is happening just eight days from today. It's scheduled to begin on the 16th of January for about a month, up until the middle of February. <clears throat> Now, let's remind you that this uh, voter registration exercise is taking place at the constituency level. So you can continue to get yourself registered, but the mass voter registration exercise starts on the 16th of January. Lest we forget, let me give you that final date you need to remember, the voting registration will be suspended on the 10th of May, after which there will be an opportunity uh, for you to just go and verify your details. I know we've talked a lot about what's not happening with respect to the timelines, but what you need to remember every single day is that you need to get yourself ready. The politicians are getting themselves ready. Some are going on the streets. Others are saying the laws must continue. What preparations are you putting in place to exercise your constitutional right? Lest we forget that date is coming up on the 16th, but it doesn't bar you from doing so every other day up until this date. As lest we forget tonight. Welcome back. Let's talk sports now. Defending Women's Africa Club champions Orange Telcom began their title defense on a winning note after edging Nigeria's Kada Babes to a 5-2 win. In another match, Ghana police powered past Uganda's Wananchi with a 6-0 win. Robinson Okenye reports. The African Hockey Club Championship got into day two in Nairobi with the women's defending champions Orange Telcom tackling Nigeria's Kada Babes in the second match of the day. Orange found it tough to break Kada's stonewall defense in the opening quarter but had to wait until the 21st minute when Rachel Usa broke the deadlock. Orange's lead, however, did not last long as the Nigerian side grabbed an equalizer two minutes later. In the second half, Jen Ofula was quick to sound the boards for the defending champions. Four minutes later, Barbara Simiu added on to Orange's lead to make matters 3-1. The lead did not, however, stop the determined Nigerians as they pulled one back to leave matters 3-2. The evergreen Jackie Mwangi added on to the eight-time champions' lead before Flavian Mutiva made matters 5-2 at death. Uh, the game was uh, tight, like you saw, and uh, game one, we never talked much about game one. As the game progresses, we'll be able to see. Game one, normally the players come in, they're a bit tense, like you saw. And uh, like now, there's some things that we're going to work on. And then we see game two, that's when now you can start seeing the true pictures of a true champion. In the other match of the day, Nigeria's heartland emerged with a 2 0 win over Tanzania. Ghana police were quick to make an arrest of their opponents as they aged 190 to a 6 0 win. In the men's tie, Ghana police emerged 5 2 winners over Nigeria's Flickers. Robinson Okenye, KTN Sports.